staying with our theme here of uh, deploying biological ideas and theories to our understanding of cities, let's talk about two major characteristic features of biological system, development and evolution. Development and evolution actually are fundamental properties of living systems in the sense that they both are historical aspects of living systems. What do we mean by development? Development basically is the life history of any organism or any biological system. It starts when, well, when it starts is actually a very interesting and difficult question, but let's assume it starts at fertilization for the time being here, even though that's not quite true, um, and then certainly ends with death. In between, organisms undergo a lot of transformations. They grow, they differentiate, they acquire their particular uh, feature, they acquire their diseases, uh, they interact with other organisms, and eventually they die. Uh, if you then look at a number of those organisms, a population of organisms through time, the variation within that, those populations will lead to evolutionary change through time. So what do we mean by variation? Where does that variation come from? Now, for all intents and purposes, um, any uh, fertilized egg cell is more or less indistinguishable from another one. Yet, by the time you grow up to be, for instance, 18, 20 years, you lo all look very different. The difference is a direct consequence of the processes of development. But genetic or genomic variation is translated in what we call phenotypic or morphological variation. Now, in that sense, uh, the processes of development and evolution are linked, because it's through development that those phenotypic differences first emerge that then might have evolutionary consequences in the sense that some organisms are better equipped to deal with particular challenges than other and therefore will survive and or reproduce and change the history of the species. So this is a very simplified notion of the developmental and evolutionary process. And let's think about how that applies to cities. Now, if you think about development, cities d don't fall from heaven in their final structure. Cities grow. Cities, in a sense, develop. Cities start from a often from a small nucleus and acquire many properties along the way. Now, in a sense, there's a difference because there is not a regulatory program, there's not, a there's not some kind of genetic information that is present at the beginning of a city that just gets executed uh, throughout its uh, lifespan. Rather, cities grow in response to their environment. But what is similar to development is that growth uh, of cities, the development of cities, the differentiation of cities follows certain rules it follows certain regulatory properties. Um, there are, not everything is possible, in other words. So the externalities uh, play a role, but also the internal structure of cities uh, plays a role. And we have to understand those rules of how cities historically develop. And again, biological ideas can help us conceptualize those processes. In particular, again, referring back to the theory of complex adaptive systems, uh, with one particular phenomenon. And that is the phenomenon, again, of phase transition. Think about it this way. You have a settlement. You have a small village. It grows. Sooner or later, we call it a, a small town, and later a city, and maybe later a megalopolis, like Los Angeles, or Phoenix, or any of the other large city areas. What happened throughout those stages and the, are those different types of cities, the different historical instantiation of a particular city, can they be understood with the same um, properties, with the same principles? The answer here is no. Depending on what happened at those critical phase transition, we get new kinds of dynamics. Those new dynamics uh, largely focus on how growth in numbers translates into changes in the interaction profile and the regulatory structure of those cities. In other words, 
we have a particular type of a city that is governed, let's say, by very local interactions, by basic democracy, for instance, and all of a sudden it becomes bigger and bigger. Those kind of face-to-face -face meetings are no longer possible. The management and the political system that governs the cities will change. When and how? Political scientists have developed a lot of uh, ideas about how to conceptualize this. Historians have described the process. Yet uh, what biology can offer here is it can offer a framework that places those kind of phase transitions in a larger context. The, s the context of evolving systems, the context of evolving social systems. Uh, the example that we use here uh, most prominently are, for instance, the social insects. Next to us, humans, the social insects have the highest degree of integration, and in, to some extent they even have a higher degree of integration than we have, and division of labor. How did a social insect colony acquire its superorganismal status? Superorganism here refers to the fact uh, that the colony, once it is tightly integrated, for all intents and purposes, behaves and acts like an organism, a superorganism. Now, obviously, uh, social insect colonies started f uh, through the interactions of individual insects that were perfectly capable of performing all the required uh, duties to live a prosperous life. Only those who, who did, by the way, survived, so those are the ones that we need to worry about. Now, what happened in the transition between individual insects and a social insect colony? Again, what happened basically is that the various tasks, the various subdivisions of labor uh, that an individual insect performed in sequence were basically turned into a parallel processing machinery. So while, a, while an individual insect can either forage or reproduce or rest, a colony can do all those things at the same time. If with each individual only performing one or a small set of specialized tasks. Now, if you think about how that can happen, the underlying uh, explanation is that there needs to be a regulatory system in the colony that enables it to actually control and tightly regulate the execution of those different tasks. How did this regulatory system come about? And uh, the way it came about is through a hierarchically expanded um, regulatory system. Now what do we mean by hierarchically expanded regulatory system? Well, if you think about an organism for uh, a moment here, an organism again is a kind of a superorganism. It is comprised of any number of cells. Each cell basically has the whole genome. It basically has the genomic information uh, to perform a whole number of tasks, yet most specialized cells only perform a small number of tasks. They are a nerve cell or a liver cell or a skin cell, for instance. Now, how does the organism regulate uh, this division of labor? Well, it regulates the division of labor in the sense that in each cell, only those parts of the genome, only those parts of the genetic information that are necessary for a particular task are expressed. So it's a reduction on the, on, the, on the level of individual cells of their potential in order to facilitate completely new dynamics on the level of the integrated whole, the organism. The same applies with the social insect colonies and that's the thesis here, the same applies to our understanding of cities and human social systems.